right. Hello. Good, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for returning for our last day of our um, third annual Black Family Homeschool Educators and Scholars Virtual Teach-In. Today's session is Creating a Pathway to Math Success. I'm so excited um, for this speaker returning because um, she was part of our second annual virtual teaching. She did a coffee talk and we didn't have the privilege of interacting with her live because our coffee talks are pre-recorded. But she is here today for a math workshop. Dion Willis is a math educator, a homeschool mom, and a passionate believer of creating our own standards for our own people. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and as I said, she was a speaker of the second annual Black Family Homeschool Educators and Scholars Virtual Teaching. And some of you who participated presentation yesterday you may have you may have recognized this face um in his presentation so i'll let her if she wishes to talk about that connection that she <laughs> has with jason esters but without further ado please welcome dion willis Hello, everybody. Hi, I thank you for coming to this discussion, this talk, this opportunity for us to kind of discuss some things mathematically. First of all, Akil, I want to put you, take you off the spot for a minute. I know you know my husband, Jason, but we haven't met. So I so I want you to know that it's okay. I, I We there. So anyway, um, thank you guys for coming. I'm going to share my screen and see if I can get my... Um, get my conversation together. Let me just do this real quick. All right, let's share that. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do is real janky right now. I'm just going to slide all the way back to my first um, first slide and just talk to you a little bit about myself and a little bit about what's um, what what I'm thinking about in terms of mathematics. My, I have a degree in mathematics. My degree is in um, secondary math. I've been teaching um, mathematics since I was 21. I'm 46 now, so that's a long time. I've been teaching in a classroom until we had kids and we decided to come home and take care of our kids in house. And so a lot of people often look at me and say, oh, you know math, you can do all of these things. And I want to be in a position where I can share some insights that I have but I'm by no means a professional. I'm by no means a professional in terms of knowing all of math and being able to answer all of your questions. And, but I'm, I'm happy for the discussion and I'm excited by that. What I want you to observe real quick as before we discuss is that um, this is a picture, this is my house. This is a picture of our bedroom, our, our son's bedroom when he, when my oldest son was five years old. Um, he is now 14, so this is long gone. But this is going to be a little bit about what I want you to think about when you're thinking about creating success for mathematics in your home and in your home school. So a couple things before we even get started, you know, I don't want to be like one of those uh, websites where you just want like a recipe and then they tell you, oh, the importance of, you know, let's say you're looking for banana bread recipe and they're, they're giving you the importance of bananas and potassium and they're giving you all this information. The fact that you're here, you know that math is important and I understand that you want to come and talk about some of these things. But I, I do think I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on a systemic situation that, that I think we're dealing with. All of these headlines that I have here, college success starts in math class. Um, you know, this one uh, by uh, Dr. Lee Stiff was back in 1998, 1988 actually. This is as recent as a few weeks ago, June 24th, making math classes more welcoming for black students. And I know our students are not traditionally schooled, but what this speaks to is the environment that they are entering into in terms of when they do transition perhaps to college, if that's the goal, or if they transition to a traditional school, we're speaking to the environment that they will be uh, uh, thrust into and the perceptions that they will have. So I wanna focus our attention today on saying that the importance of being intentional about math education is that mathematical understanding is directly related to study and career opportunities in college and beyond. I just want to say that I, I also want to say that math is our right. It is our right and it is our, our um, legacy of understanding. It is not some privilege, but we also understand that in this society, it's importance to study and career opportunities in the future um, should not be missed. We should not miss that, that, that opportunity to speak that out. So um, 
the bias that really matters. Oftentimes when we talk about education and we talk about um, um, specifically bias in the classroom and we talk about why black students are not as successful, you know, I think sometimes the picture in our mind is about whether there's racism in the textbook. And so I actually, I pulled out this, these pictures from this textbook. I'm gonna see if I can put it up here. Um, this is something that I got from one of the schools. I taught at an independent school several years ago and they were getting rid of old books. So I took them home because that's what I do. So I've got all these books at my house. And so I was checking out this book recently, like just like we need to clean off the shelves. We got too much stuff. I mean, books are spilling down. So I'm looking at it and I'm like, yo, Jay, that's my husband. I'm like, look, check out this, these pictures. And it's going to be hard to see, but there are just some real mad racist pictures here, right? Just such racism. Every representation of black people in here uh, are disfigured physically. This book was written in 1960. They still sell, sell it on Amazon with lots of positive reviews. Nobody's saying anything negative. Is that the bias that matters? Certainly, if we were back in the 1960s, and someone presented me with math problems from this book and I had to look at it, I'd feel more than some type of way, right? I'd be angry and it would not encourage me. But what I'm here to say is though this is horrible and heinous, the bias that really matters is the truths that we as educators hold in our hearts and our minds. When we face our students of color, when we face our kids, when we face communities that speak about these things, when we read about it, when we think about it, when we're constantly inundated with what we call the achievement gap. I'm not really here to talk about those particular things, the achievement gap and all of this verbiage around um, black success and, and math classes. But what I am here to, to talk about is how are you personally looking at your child when you are teaching the math? What is the the conversation that you have with your child? What is the relationship that you are developing with your child around mathematics? Because I am here to say that I really believe that we have endured however many years we've been on this planet. So much of the bias and bias training mentally that we could perhaps be the problem between our children achieving and our children not achieving the success we want in mathematics. That is a suggestion. I'm not saying anybody's not doing a good job, but I'm, I'm just trying to speak to you from my personal experiences. So here's what, I, here's what I'm looking at for me. I want you to take a moment and just experience these sentences. I'm gonna give you about four sentences and I want you to just observe how you feel when you hear it. What, what's the feeling that you have? Do you, does your heart beat a little faster? Do you get calmed? Are you like, I'm affirmed? What are your thoughts? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with, uh, with this statement. There is no such thing as a math person. Anyone can have success in math. You can be a successful math teacher or guide for your children. You may have to go back to school to learn a little more math in order to be successful. I want to stop here real quick and just see if I can get some. I hope I can work this well. In the chat, just tell me what you felt. Did any of those did anything, did you feel anything with any of those statements, whether this doesn't feel true or I don't like it or I do like it? In the chat, if you can just take, we're going to just take one minute just to throw some comments in the chat that I can look at. Let me know if you had any reaction to any of those statements. That's what I want to know. Any feeling? Mm, mm, yes, I'm hearing you, Tamika. Uh, annoyed, yes, because many of us has missed out on a quality education and now have to learn or unlearn. I praise God on the unlearn. I know that's right. I think I need to go back to school to learn more. There are more resources here. I heard that. Yes, 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 yes. I'm with you. I'm with you all. Anxious. Yes, yes, yes. Here's what I want to say about those comments. The fact of the matter is the last one 
um, isn't real, right? I'm getting ahead of myself. The last one isn't real. It, it, it isn't real. But what I want to say is if you felt stress with the last couple of couple of phrases, that stress is real and it informs how you teach your kids. And so I feel like there's a place, I, I really do. You know, I've been thinking about it more and more. What is the common denominator in education? It really is the teacher, it's the teacher's perception. I could teach out of that book, that racist book that I showed you, the pictures of, I could teach out of that and, and, and we can be okay. But I have to believe in those kids that are in front of me and I have to believe in myself. And so my point in bringing up these statements, I'm gonna just go through them one by one. Anyone can, let me go back real quick, hold on. Um, there is no such thing as a math person. I really do feel um, uncomfortable by that phrase a little bit. And the only reason why is because there is a reverence we give to people who have a supposed or a true understanding of mathematics and it's all available to us. I'm gonna say that when I go out with my girlfriends to a restaurant and I say something like this, oh honey, that costs $2 and that's $5. You know what? It's gonna be $7 for us. Do you know what they do? They say, girl, you a math person. Adding two and five to get seven does not make me a math person. I'm not saying that as a diss, but I'm saying that as being mindful of the fact that we somehow separate ourselves from supposed people who are math people. And sometimes it's just you had a better chance at education. Also, sometimes it's just because the way they were giving it out made sense to you. As homeschoolers, we all know when we teach our kids that we are teaching unique individuals. What worked with one kid didn't work with the other. What worked with one homeschool family friend did not work, does, may not work with us. So it is important for us to keep that in mind that maybe there's no such thing as a math person. Maybe you just like the way it's taught in textbooks better. And so I wanna talk a little bit about that as we go forward. Anyone can have success in math. I think we need to define success as what? Is it getting A's on a test? That's how the larger traditional society does, right? If you get A's, if your grades look good, you are successful. But for us, I think we really need to consider that success is understanding and making connections and being able to use those connections. When we talk about you personally being a math teacher and a guide for your students, I, I want you to change the idea because sometimes, this is back when I was in um, teacher school, we talked about being the sage on the stage as opposed to the guide on the side, right? And so we have this idea that the teacher has all the answers, walks into the room, knows the answers. People always do it. They say, wait a minute, is this right to me? Miss Willis, is this right? I'm like, I have no idea. Let me sit down and think about it. The fact of the matter is very few people are savants. Most teachers are not, and we are not expected to be that for our children. If you don't know something, do you understand the beauty of your children seeing you learn it with you? Can you imagine? If you have to go back and figure out algebra, you once knew it, but now it's a little fuzzy. You can actually submit to that learning. Do you know how what, what a lesson that is for our children to see that, you know what, I might not have gotten it here or I may not remember it from there, but I can still do it. I am still able. So that's something I really want you to hold in your heart. And so back to the, the final question or the, the final statement that I wanted to um, that I put up there that I wanted to discuss overcoming your feelings about this particular this particular question, this particular statement is about conquering that internal bias that sometimes is communicated to our children in the way we teach. I can say this for a fact. I've got four kids. I can say this for a fact. I'm a math teacher. I like math. I stress out when I teach my kids math. I'm just going to be honest with you. I am not going to act like I do it well and all the information I'm giving you is because every day is a perfect day. In fact, there are tears in my house around math from time to time. All four of them. Every kid. I'm not saying that I'm the greatest person in the world, but I don't think tears, you know, if they're crying, they're not dying. That's my theory. But also tears just means it's hard. And we need to figure out a way to get through this hard thing. What a better way to get through hard things if not with your family and your parents. Here is a challenge that we're going to meet together. Let's do it because I know you are able. So I'm not a perfect math mom, mathematician, math teacher. But what I do know is that going through the difficult times 
gives my children and gives um, gives me the reminder that not only are they able, but we are able to not only teach our kids, but support them in their education journey. So I wanna talk specifically, because I said I was gonna give some tips or some ideas. And like I said, I really think the, the, the biggest thing that you can, that you can come away with is the first thing we talked about. It really is, we need to actively undo some of the things that we have allowed to happen to us throughout the years, just by virtue of being here. Let me tell you a story. This is my sons, my older two sons, Biko and JD. There's Biko right here, and here's JD over here. And in this picture, they are um, five and three years old. That's their bedroom. And I want you to observe a couple things. Up here, I have a number line that looks like it was really trounced pretty badly, but there's a number line there, there's a map, there's some words on the side, and on this side is that first picture that you saw, which had number facts. Those number facts were really just for my kids to have like an opportunity to, in, um, to engage mathematics without me around so they could see it. Because kids are so open. Now, the story I want to tell you is that it doesn't matter what kind of a pure environment we create for our kids in terms of um, influences they're always going to hear influences from other places and other things. So JD is now 12 years old. Last year when we were dealing with all the issues, um, actually two years ago when we, when, when, when we were dealing with all the protests and everything, um, and we were dealing with George Floyd. Now, I have to let you know, we live in a predominantly black neighborhood for the most part. Uh, we attend a uh, black church. Um, we are, commun we, we are um, in fellowship with a very diverse uh, co-op we always have people of color around and and all of them are really positive and, and very loving and awesome okay my son when we were talking about issues around race turns to me and said you know what when i read a book and they tell me about somebody in prison oftentimes i think that they must be black and i had to stop who told you that we had to sit down and unpack that whole thing what does that have to do with math what it has to do with everything is that those insidious <laughs> messages are getting to our kids, whether it's from TV, whether it's from quiet conversations, they hear me have with dad, yo, was he black? Oh, my goodness. All of that, they getting. And we have to be mindful about being deliberate about what's in our spirit, how we communicate with our kids, how, what things we allow and subject, we allow them to be subjected to. Does that make sense? Hopefully that, that's all right. So anyway, let me get a little bit more back to the math. Math education through the preschool year. So I believe in, in really having opportunities for kids to have some um, passive learning to make sure that everything that we're doing is going to be, um, in a sense, in line with our educational objectives. Constantly, never, never create a space where, I would say, I'm just gonna be hardcore about it, even if you have not had a great relationship with mathematics, do not tell your kids, oof, math, I can't. Just say, oh, this is one we're gonna have to do together. We're gonna have to grow together on this. We have to change our language. If, if every time you say, Ma, if, if your kids say, come help me with this long division, they see your face. They see, they feel you. You know how your kids know you and you look and you're like surprised that they have reflected something that you didn't even think you were showing. They see it, they feel it. So here's, here's a couple ways that I think are important, particularly in these preschool years. Bulletin boards with math facts on it, as you saw. A number line, as I mentioned before. If I get to share this, I have links here that can take you directly to places. I, I have no affiliates, I'm not getting paid for nothing just a place where you can see a number line that might be might work for your um, home. We have steps in our house. So one of the things I always do with my little ones, whether I'm holding them or walking downstairs, is we will we will be counting the stairs. We'll count each step. And so, you know, even now my four-year-old says, no, mom, there's 17. I say, no, there's 16. And part of it is, when do you start counting the step? Do you count when you're down or do you count when you're at the top? So little things like this, constantly keeps numbers in their minds. We have a very, a painted chalkboard in our kitchen. That's something that we always, I can go and quickly do a math problem or quickly talk about something or draw a picture and have the kids count it or whatever. Base 10 blocks are really um, nice. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Hopefully you are. They're basically just, they, they're, uh, maybe I shouldn't do this. I don't know if the thing is going to, okay, good. Okay, so this is what base 10 blocks look like. It really just gives the children an idea 
of number placement. So when you've got numbers in the tens place and the ones place, and, and what I do with my young one right now is he just plays with them. And he plays with them on watching shows sometimes. And then I ask him, oh, what's that? And he said, this is a hundred ma. And I love the fact that he can have a visual, physical representation of what a hundred is in these flats over here. That's like, a, it's supposed to be a hundred blocks all connected together. Um, the reason why I'm showing you this is really for you to just think, not that this is the answer, nothing I'm saying here is the answer to math success, but the spirit with which I'm coming at it and the spirit with which I'm sharing this with you is, is part of math success. Have tangible things for your kids to play with around the house. Have um, opportunities to have discussion. There's also something called um, pattern blocks, which is just a lot of different shapes, square, triangles, um, uh, rhombuses, parallelograms, L you learn those terms. So they, they are afforded the vocabulary to go out in the world and say, I know what this is. That is power, making sure we can, we can give our kids vocabulary. And so at this stage, when we're talking about preschool years, I would say, and I don't know, everybody won't agree, um, try to make all the videos that you have, anything that they're watching that's, um, that's like cartoons or, or whatever, Make sure that they're educational. Make sure that there's something that they're getting from it and, and try to draw that line. And I know it's hard. Sometimes we as parents, especially homeschool parents with multiple children, sometimes you need that in-class babysitter and you might say, here's the phone or here's, here's the TV. There's no judgment. But what I want to say is there are some really good educational programs out there that will provide some really wonderful foundations. Right now I'm thinking off the top of my head, I do number blocks with my youngest son. We do um, number blocks is like this British show where, um, or I, I, it's on Netflix. Um, number blocks, alpha blocks is a, is a similar one. And then there's story bots. Make sure that the television that they're watching is quality and make sure it's leading to educational understanding and outcomes. And also we gotta watch it. Sometimes there's some real sub subliminal racist information that's being put out in some of the uh, videos that they have. Um, and I won't get into that, but I have seen it. And then when it comes to workbooks and stuff like that, I think really you need to just figure out if that's where your child is. I know um, my daughter, I have a daughter, she is nine, she'll be 10 soon. She is has never been great with writing. That has not been her gift. She's more verbal. So a workbook wouldn't have worked for her. My oldest son liked workbooks and my youngest son likes them, but it all, it all what we don't want to do is the word workbook already does it. We don't want to make it a situation where they are, where it is a burdensome thing, where we are recreating school at home. That's not homeschool. I don't know why you're homeschooling, but we have chosen to do something differently because we didn't want to do what they're doing there in our homes. And so that's an important distinction to make. So when you bring out the workbooks at this early age or when you bring out any kind of things like that, make it fun, make it interactive, make it enjoyable, all right? Make sure that you know um, that they are developing a positive relationship with that type of work. I'm gonna go on to, let's see what else we got going on here. I'm gonna go on to this next slide, which is really about the elementary years. So when I think about the elementary years, for me personally, I, I'm, I'm really into the idea that um, this is the time, and I know people talk about memorization is lame and we should have kids figuring it out. You know how you have sight words? Kid, words that the, ch the children just need to know? You guys all know sight words. You don't want every time your child is reading a word for them to go, it, it, sit. I got it, my sit. That's not it. We, you just, you need to have the the the, uh, the rapid understanding and movement through language when you're reading. It is the same thing with mathematics. So sometimes people say, oh, you don't need to memorize stuff. I'm a believer that you do, and and it, your homeschool is your your school so I, I i definitely leave that autonomy up to you but as a math teacher with 20 some odd years of experience watching kids fumble through long division in high school watching students ask me questions like a thousand divided by five is like 79 right and not having the wherewithal to say no that that's not real sensible 
because they just don't have the experience of the numbers, they're relying on a phone or a calculator to give them that information. I think that's a real drawback. I think having that quickness is part of the ability to move forward in mathematics. So one of the things I will talk about is memorization at this stage. All right, so what about curriculum? I'm not picky about curriculum, y'all. I'm gonna be honest. The number one rule, and this is with whatever grade, you are going to choose what works for you and your family and your household. If it's working, use it. How do you know if it's working? It should be challenging. I'm not saying that there should be tears every day. Indeed, that's not what we want. We don't want every time math comes up for it to be a negative thing, but you do want it to be challenging because there is no worth when it's not challenging. Children know when they're be told, oh, good job, good job, and they know they haven't done anything. They know it. But when they have worked hard, even cried a bit, and then got through it and said, look at you, there is a self-confidence that you can't, you know, we kind of we kind of erred on the idea of, you know, everybody needs to be encouraged. Yeah, but you need to be encouraged with, for things that you've actually done. So for instance, I my oldest son, he's 14, he's finishing up his algebra book this year. This um this summer is the goal. And so in the process, you know, there was a time when I was like, oh, this is just, we can't do this with you. And he said, no, Ma, I want to show you I can do it. I appreciated the grit, but I didn't want to um, I didn't want to compromise his education just because he wanted to show mom he could do it. But when he was able to get through factor and quadratics and some things that I, I felt like, all right, maybe we're going to have to go back to another book and wait a little bit. When he got through that, the pride that he had and the power that you get from doing hard things, hard things are hard because they're difficult and they hurt. So we do want our math books to be challenging, but not so much so that there are no moments of success. It is important that they have moments of success. It is important that you can celebrate them. It is important you could say, well done. It is important when you could say, dad, I really didn't think of that. Yes, my kids give me that moment all the time. Oh, I didn't even think like that. That's so dope. I love how you're thinking and really mean it, not just for the sake of saying the nice things, all right? They also, and this is important, this is something that um, I, I know traditionally school children have difficulty with, is being, but this is something we can do as homeschoolers. We can make sure our kids are able to explain the why and how. If you don't understand mathematics very well, or if it's not your thing, or if you feel uncomfortable, Get your child to explain it to you. Tell me why you did that. Tell me how that works. Show mom, show dad, explain to me what it, what's going on. And this is something I added and I don't know how, um, how other people feel about this. There is something about being able to hold up a book and say, oh, I finished that. I did it. Or a chapter to say, I finished three chapters out of that. Having a sense of completion. Sometimes when we're in a place of frustration, we might abandon a book or abandon a chapter bring your child back to that place and say look at my look at how you've grown look at what you've learned so far we finished it there's something very important in that kind of a message as well all right um so elementary years i have some curriculum suggestions and they are merely suggestions my friends they are not by any mean they're they are what i happened upon i like life of fred to me it's not a standalone curriculum here's some life of fred books that they have. This is more of the, um, and there's pictures. My husband put some pictures in there for us. So the books are not great standalone books, but what I enjoyed for me anyway, and what I think about when I think about a real full curriculum in mathematics, I feel like they're great. Um, they're great. What can I say? I wouldn't say extracurricular. It's they're great fodder for more thought, deeper discussion. I like the way the author handles the book. I like um, what he does in terms of taking really big concepts and bringing it right down to the level where, yes, you can also understand the, the concept of infinity as, as a three-year-old. You can also understand, you know, these things whenever your child is ready for such. I like Singapore mathematics. That was really good for my kids. They um, did that. Um, that was, that's over here. I like this particular author. This is, um, this is actually written in Singapore, but then they adjusted it for the U.S addition the singapore math curriculum came out of the idea that singapore was doing so well and a lot of people were like oh well we should teach math like they do um and so that happened maybe about almost 15 20 years ago and so this is a thing but i did enjoy the books 
I saw how it developed my children's thinking in a, a very a very positive way of being able to draw pictures and really understand the mathematics. I felt like it gave them understanding. Beast Academy is what I'm currently using with my nine year old. Um, the good thing about that uh, series, it's, it, it's a bit pricey. Um, there's eight books in each, there's eight books for each grade level. So this, it's like an A, B, and C. So I'm holding this one up and this one up. One is the guide and one is the practice book. The practice book will be exactly as you think it would be. It's just a bunch of practice problems. It's work, it's workbook. I know you can't see that well. But the cool thing about this, and this is nice if you have a verbal child, like not verbal, but a, a child who really likes write, reading and stuff like that, reading and stuff, right? If you have a child that enjoys reading and doesn't always enjoy a math textbook, this is a comic book. Let me do it that way. This is a comic book that explains all the concepts. It is by um, a group or a company called Art of Problem Solving. And I really do, and they're, they're mathematicians, I really do like their work. I like what they do. Um, I like that sometimes it stumps me and I have to think about it again. And I understand that that might feel ambitious. If you're like, if you are stumped and you have a degree in math, I don't feel like being stumped. But there is journey and joy in the journey of learning with your children. There is joy in the journey of learning with your children and there's joy in them being able to say, oh, we did hard stuff today. So I don't want you to throw away any ideas. And finally, um, the, the other thing that we use pretty regularly is IXL. What I like about this particular, um, it's not a curriculum. So I'm gonna say Life of Fred is, I would not call it a curriculum. IXL, I would not necessarily call it a curriculum, but it is curriculum support, question and answers. They answer the questions, they do good explanations. And again, all of these are links that you can see that at another time. So that those are things that I like for elementary school. And you're going to see that some of these things are going to come back. So um, again, I like having the number line up. I like the kids knowing that negative and positive numbers exist very early because why not? You know what I mean? So it's not a weird thing. So, you know, you can, if uh, your child is asking you, well, what is a negative number? Well, it means you lost. You can, you know what I mean? We can talk about, or you owe somebody, or there's, there's, um, we can create different ways for them to have a conceptual understanding of things that we usually say, oh, we'll save that for high school. Well, we don't have to. I also like, so I have math facts walls, as we mentioned before, burgeoning concepts. So like at this stage, they're probably not doing fractions or percentages, but why not have a fraction circle when you can look up and say, oh, that's half. Do you want half of a cookie? Oh, let, let me give you one quarter of my. So just even having the language early on in the elementary years really gives students, we are empowering our kids to say that, no, 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 this is for you too, right? This is for you too. Um, base 10 blocks I mentioned and showed you primary instruction using chosen curriculum. So what I would, when you're thinking about directed instruction, I, I definitely think that we are all capable of teaching our elementary and primary school children mathematics. And I think that there is a place for additional tutoring and support. Don't wanna be real um, long-winded about this, but I feel like in our community, um, sometimes we don't always see tutoring um, in the same way as other communities do. And to me, that's fine. Other communities tutor because they are trying to get the edge on, our, on their kids. Like I, I taught at, um, at an independent school, Principal Academy out here for uh, some years. And I remember all of my students, all of them had tutors. They had tutors and they were getting good grades in the class, but they had tutors because that was a part of the package of sending your kid to a school that is thirty, forty five thousand dollars per year. That was part of the package. That's what they expected to do in order to give their kids the edge. Um, additional tutoring, I think, in the context that we need to talk about, we need to create spaces and places where we can support our kids' education as a community. One of the things that, uh, and so going back to my experience, I started tutoring for one of the companies that tutored the kids at the school. And uh, basically they paid me $40 while they charged the family $75. And so you can see where that is. I, I feel like when we deal with education and money, the people who are gonna lose out are people who have less of the money. And that being said, I think we need to make alternative strategies so that our kids can have quality support. I think we need to create it ourselves. Those creations to me looks like, why can't we empower other homeschoolers to tutor our kids or to, to be a part of a network of 
hey, every week I want you to contact X, Y, and Z online so you can do your homework with them because communicating mathematics concepts is so important. You know, sometimes we have these like real automatic, nice um, programs where you can say, oh, well, I, I got a curriculum that's online and it checks their work and all of that stuff. And it's a lot of multiple choice questions. Here is the real thing. I've seen kids use that type of program. I've seen kids work through that. Our children are so smart that they know how to answer questions without knowing the material. They are so capable that if they've got a multiple choice question, if multiple choice test in front of them, they can answer it by process of elimination and deduction. And they may not actually understand the concept. I've seen it too many times with some of the online school interactions. Does that mean we throw it out? No, it just means that having additional support. If you can't, if you don't feel like you've got the time to do it, hire a high school kid to do it. Hire somebody who can just check in on your kids so you can have an opportunity to know that they are communicating their mathematics. Have them make videos of what they understand. Just, hey, show me how you did that problem. Make a video, let's talk about it just different ways of communicating. So using videos to support learning, one way is to create the videos. And the other way is to, as I think somebody mentioned in the comments, is there's so many resources available. Lots of people are on YouTube making videos about mathematics and things like that. Use those videos to enhance your understanding and your children's. All right, I feel like I need to move a little bit faster. So here we are, these are my kids again. This is now, they're in high school and uh, middle school. They're in that age range. And I wanna just talk a little bit about ways to support them at this time mathematically. So I, I, it's getting rough here, lots of things on the screen. What should be mastered before high school? So these are things that I feel like, I feel like some of you should know before middle school, but you've got to have that multiplication memorized. You've gotta know how to add and subtract very easily, fluidly with integers. Long division, I know that people have been saying for years, you don't need to have it. Oh, you know, there's other ways we've got calculators. Have your child learn long division. It's okay. It is It is so possible and, and there it is so available to them. I can't tell you how many times, literally over the 20 years that I've been teaching outside of my home that um, I have seen this trip students up um, and it's to their detriment. And what happens when they're tripped up, they don't say, oh, I could learn this. What they say is, oh, I don't know it. And internally, the message is, I, I can't do it. I'm not bright enough. Okay, so fluidity with operations on decimal numbers. That's another place where like decimals, people just throw their hands up in the air. And of course, fractions. These are things that we want to think about. Notice I'm not doing like first grade. You got to know this. Second grade. I, I honestly don't believe in grades per se. But I do think if we want to make sure and have our kids able to transition, if it has to be that they have to go to a traditional school. I think this is a general set of information that's going to give them the power to be able to be successful anywhere. So those are basic um, things that they should be able to do. Here are some concepts that they should understand. They should have a good understanding of percentages, distance as it relates to time, as it, as it, as it relates to the rate and time, unit conversions, use of formulas, area, and so forth and so on. This is not exhaustive. But if you give me a kid that is tight in all of these areas, I can teach them algebra one, hands down. If you give me a kid that can have this, even if there's some, some hiccups here and there, if you give me a kid that can do the first set of things, basic success, those things, if you can do that, we can move to algebra. It might take us a little bit longer. It might, we might have to do some work, but we can do that, all right? Okay, couple things here and then I'm going to get out of your way. So uh, math education. So I mentioned um, Beast Academy. Um, I have Glencoe Mathematics here. And the reason why is because when I taught in schools, that was the, the common school textbook that they would use, these Glencoe math textbooks. Nothing's great or earth shattering about them. It really is um, just the presentation of information. It's very organized and it's very, I'm going to say, there's a type of math that is see this, do this. And what the see this, do this really means is, here's a way to do a thing. I'm gonna show it to you. And now you do the same thing 20 times with different numbers. It is a form of mathematics. I'm not dissing it. That's how I learned. I appreciated it because I like to memorize things and do stuff like that. 
It's not the greatest, but it's not the worst. What is going to be important is the communication that you have with your children around mathematics and the information that you guys bring together as you are having that discussion. Um, Saxon math is one that a lot of people use. I am not a particular fan of it because of the organization doesn't work with my mind. However, I've seen kids be wonderfully successful with Saxon math. So I did want to include it here. Life of Fred again has some high school um, books where they do try to get a little bit more into um, re repetition for students to get mastery over uh, concepts. I'll be working with a student this fall with that. So I know that it is a doable thing and a place to go, but you have to really know your child in order to um, in order to ascertain what is best in that department. Um, the IXL website, as we mentioned before, is something that I have often and, and, and enjoy using with my kids. Again, it's not a teacher and, and it does um, lead to frustration because you got this number right at the side about how many you got correct and what's your smart score. And so, you know, it kind of leads into some of the some of the issues that we have in general. But we need to I believe we need to uh, teach our kids to be beyond that and understand that their education is for their improvement only, not necessarily for comparative purposes. And I know that's a statement that I can unpack, but I'm going to let that go for now. Um, again, um, I think there's something I'm, I really want to uh, stay here for a little bit. When you think about middle middle and high school years and you think about if you were traditionally schooled and you think about um, what you saw when you walked into a classroom, you would see a lot of the things, a lot of the topics that you would perhaps be be covering, whether the uh, Pythagorean theorem is over there or uh, area formulas are over there. I think that we should um, have a space where we can have passive learning opportunities for our kids, even in high school and middle school, where they have a topical formula list. Maybe you can't put all the formulas up, but if this unit they're working on a particular thing, they should be able to see it. They should be able to walk, you know, from one room to another and get a little bit more math input, a little bit more math input. And I know some people have very beautiful homes where they do not want to put things up on the wall. I understand that. Um, I would say consider it anyway, because there is something about being able to see things up and have it reinforced that way. I'm learning that as a teacher who teaches a lot of a lot of students online that, oh, they don't have that constant reinforcement that I did. So that's something that I think we can do for our homeschoolers, particularly in this in this area of mathematics um, measurements and relationships, knowing, you know, uh, one pint is equal to two cups, things like that, that we kind of just forget. The children should see that. They should have that up. It'll be helpful for us. And it's things that we can talk about, giggle over. You know how you just have little random conversations with your kids about whatever? Those are random conversations are beautiful learning opportunities as well. So I want to keep that in mind. I'm going to go over here to um, primary. OK, so when we get to middle and high school, this is where we're probably thinking about outsourcing instruction at times. Um, I, I want, whether you're doing primary at home instruction, collaborative instruction, where you're, you're having somebody come and help, or you're totally outsourcing it, for you not to be out of the loop. Okay, so I understand timing, relearning algebra to teach your kids, relearning pre-calculus to teach your kids. It's probably, it's probably not an effective strategy at this point in the game. But do, I'm going to say do, I'm going to say do, have them explain something to you. Have them teach you. If, it, if, it's, if it's at the level where they can do that, have them teach you. Have them have, enjoy mathematics with your kids. Enjoy, even if you don't like the mathematics per se, enjoy their ability to conquer it with them. You know? All right. Um, using videos to support learning. I've already kind of discussed that. Opportunities to discuss math with feedback. I, I want to kind of, um, I think I should circle back to that. I've seen students struggle where they um, they don't have, you know, the, the, the automatic feedback is great. You're, you know, you got the multiple choice question wrong. Okay, fine. Kids learn quickly to ignore that, to move on to the next thing. They don't read through and say, oh, wait a minute, how did I factor that incorrectly? It's the rare student that does, and the students that do, that's great. But even my student, even my kids, and I know that they're good kids, and I know that they're, they're smart, 
they are not reading through that. They know that mommy has said, you need to do 20 minutes of X, Y, Z, and they're trying to get the time done, or they know that they need to get a certain score. They need feedback. They need opportunities to discuss what they're learning. They need that time to do that. So even if in our, in our quest to create environments of, of better support and learning for our kids, even if we get together with other homeschoolers to do that, that would be wonderful. I had an opportunity, oh darn it. I see that the time is running. I just glanced up. All right, I'm gonna uh, try to keep going as soon as somebody tells me to stop talking. But real rap, when you, if you get an opportunity to even just collaborate online where you have homeschoolers teaching each other bits of information, it can be powerful. As a teacher, I know that I've learned more on this side of the desk than I did on the other side. You know what I mean? I've learned more by being a teacher, by having to learn it and to explain it to somebody else, seeing how they think it through and, um, you know, just kind of acknowledging the beautiful things um, that, that I'm learning with them as I try to teach them. Final important takeaways, please interrogate your conscious and subconscious negative feelings about math, address them and work through them. Know that we are just a product of our environment. Um, know that we take in the information, the negative concepts and, and, and things that people tell us, and then we definitely inadvertently, but we do take it out on our kids in a way. We have to watch that in this racist society. I don't mean to be all like extra, you know, but we have to. I've seen it so many times and in so many ways how we will... Um, Anyway, that's for another discussion. I hope I get an opportunity to have one with some of you or all of you at another time. All right, cultivate a math environment in your home for subtle learning opportunities. Prepare to demonstrate understanding and a willingness to learn mathematics to assist your child in learning as well. And finally, no matter what the curriculum or source of delivery you use to educate your child, be sure to have the expectation of communication around math topics. I would like to open this up for questions if there is time. I couldn't read the chat the whole time, but I'm going to save the chat and I would love to uh, have an opportunity to talk to any of you at any time. Um, but if there's any questions and if we have time, I'd love to hear them. I think you can unmute yourself if you'd like to. Hello. Hey. Um, what are your thoughts on teaching textbooks? And I really enjoyed the presentation. It was wonderful. Oh, thank you so much. You said teaching textbooks, my thoughts. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma I think that, uh, and I know this sounds a little um, corny, anything that works for your family works. It's not like, the, textbooks are not egregiously, we, we live in a wonderful country where there's so much abundance. Our textbooks are generally pretty good. If you are teaching your child by yourself, if you are if you are the main provider of in, conduit of education, whatever textbook you like and are going to feel comfortable getting through, that's where you're going to start. You might have to adjust, maneuver, and move depending on where your child is and how they're being fed, if that makes sense. If you realize it's too easy or if it's too hard, there's too many days of tears, we can't get through that. We can't do it. I am comfortable with literally anything, spectrum math books, those ones you get from the corner store or from like the drug stores, um, all of those are fine. But what really matters is the getting through it and, and that communication with your child and that conversation and the ability to grow from that experience. Are you with me? Yes, ma'am. I, I appreciate that because I, when you were talking about the um, multiple choice and with them, figuring out how to answer the questions. Yes. That hit home with me with the teaching textbooks. You know, it's an online, it's a multiple choice. You know, it's, it's the whole whole thing. Yes, yes. If, if that's what you, if that's the best that you have, like if that's what y'all need to do for now, do that, but circle back with communication. Like it, it the problem is sometimes because homeschooling is hard, you want to send at least one of them off to go do something. And you're like, your math is good. The data says it's good. I'm good. I'm just saying we can't always trust. We have to see for ourselves. We have to maintain um, being the one in the room that cares the most about their child's education. You know what I mean? Yes, ma'am. And I, honestly, the reason I, I chose that mm -hmm. was because, like you said at the beginning of the presentation, I have such 
math uh, anxiety myself that I was like, well, I have to get something that's, you know, really kind of doing it for them because I don't want to, you know, lead them the wrong way when it comes to math. I get it. I get it. I get it. And, and, and I say that's excellent. I do. I still say, have that conversation. I still say, explain to me what you're doing. I still say, if you don't feel comfortable, because there is a part of us that's like, we want to be the one with the answer. And sometimes it's hard to put ourselves in a position of, um, of not mastery, of not knowing. I know that's, that's my way for science sometimes. I'm like, I oh, don't know, baby. But um, sometimes that is a greater learning opportunity than them having this, op this experience off to the side. And I would say, I don't believe in, in really expensive tutoring. I think I think there's enough people in our community where we can look out for each other. You know, I'm not going to go and try to try to create a barter system. But if you are consistent about whatever you're doing, like, hey, I'm going to give you five dollars to check homework with my child to a high school, a high school kid or something or or something along those lines, a college kid. People are out there who are willing to help. I think we need to we need to be specific and consistent about supporting people in the work that they do. But I don't think we need to make um, education this um, this inaccessible seventy five dollar an hour um, uh, uh, support system for our kids. You know what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am. And I, I I truly appreciate that. I just this whole presentation has been like a weight lifted off of me. You know, because math I'm sure is, is sometimes can be a doozy. I understand. A lot of people. Yes, 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 yes. I'm so I'm so glad. Thank you. I I, I saw um I'm just looking not in order at the chat. I see somebody asked about Zern. I haven't heard of it, but I will look it up. Um I'm saving my chat, so I'm looking forward to doing that. Um and I, I just want to jump in because as we wind down, we have a session that starts at one. I did want to encourage folks um, because I see a lot of wonderful communication going on in the chat. Yeah. Please use our chat, our group chat feature on the teaching site so that all of this information will be accessible to you all, even when the sessions are over, so that you can go back to it, so you can click on things and so you can share with each other. Although the rule of the, the teaching is not to self promote and you shouldn't be advertising or selling anything, but when you're sharing resources, that's a very different animal. And so um, it seems like you all um, already got your early access to Akil Parker, who's going to be presenting um, at, <laughs> later today. And I could I see um, him offering resources, but mm -hmm. all of this conversation. And I ask um, if Dion would be willing to stick around or, or to um, communicate with you all in the group chat, then she can also be available um, for your questions that you may have even when her session is over. So if we can just give a snap and we can, um, you if your cameras are on and just let her know how amazing this workshop is. I know it's gonna be so many replays of this wonderful presentation, it was excellent. Started excellently, ended excellently. Um, and we just wanna thank you, Dion, for being a part of our community, for sharing all these um, these tips. Is there um, uh, any social media that you wanted to share with folks so that they can find you online? Um, you know what, My uh, the best way right now is really just uh, email. I know that sounds lame, but I will happily uh, talk to you. My name is Dion Willis at gmail.com. So you can, you can find me there. I'm gonna put it in the chat right now. Um, spelled probably the way you would expect but i'll, I'll, I'll put that down um and, and you also have a marketplace site too dion where you can put all your information in there and all a lot of the things that you talked about if you wanted to share any of your resources you you can do that there as well okay all right, all right. thank you so much it's been a pleasure thank you yay bye everyone see see bye. some of you at one take care bye bye